My name is Spencer Rogers. I'm a specialist in hurricane resistant build, building construction and shoreline erosion for North Carolina Sea Grant. I'm housed at the UNC Wilmington Center for Marine Science and I'm an adjunct faculty member at NC State University's Department of Civil Engineering. Um, my topic is estuarine erosion management alternatives and I'd like to start with some questions that I'm not going to use the mic, but I'll repeat your answers. So my first question is, I noticed that most of you are designers and contractors, builders. Um, why do you get calls for interest in these issues? Land. And what's the pro piece of land was the answer. What's the problem? Is there erosion of the land? Do they care about erosion of the marsh? No, they don't. So in order to apply what we're talking about today for your clients, which are the landowners, the real target is upland erosion. And if you're gonna market and design for something that they want, you're gonna to have to address the upland erosion process. And what we're offering today is some multiple methods that can be used to effectively address those upland erosion problems. Now, what is the primary concern of the property owner and how to fix the problems? Money. <laughs> So one of the advantages of some of the alternatives we're offering today is the cost. And you know, we all start at the least cost solution and work up from there. So the challenge of what we're trying to convey to you and to show you how to apply is looking at the least cost solution and working up to whatever it takes to fix the problem to satisfy the property owners. So with that, if I can figure out you know, first of all, I'm, I'm going to go through the types of shorelines that we've got in coastal North Carolina. Uh, it's a limited number. Uh, the first would be swamp forest. We're not really dealing with, with much of that today, and it's usually, as you've heard before, sheltered areas. But the second would be marshes, which could either have mudflats or oysters in front of them. Uh, the third type of, uh, is low sediment bank, and They've got a lot more options that you may deal with at the same time or subcategories. They could have either marshes, swamp forests, sand, woody debris, or oyster SAV areas in front of them. And the fourth type is high sediment banks. We've got some of those scattered around the state. Um, and the fifth is overwash barriers or inlet areas. They're associated typically with barrier islands or inlets. Could be a, 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 an inlet spit or an overwash area on the that's gone over the ocean front and into the backside of a barrier island area. Now, if we look at the, the classes of erosion management options that we've got available, there are only a limited list of five. Just about everything you can think of or can imagine will fall into one of these options. And they're avoid the problem, plan it, harden the shoreline, trap some sand, or add some sand to the system. Those are the tools that you've got available and those are the ones that we've got to work with. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, and you know, we're going to talk about a, a lot of impacts, both biological and physical today, but all of these solutions have trade-offs. Any solution that you choose, including no action, is going to have a trade-off. If we go back to that list, simply avoiding the problem and do nothing, you're trading upland property for aquatic property. That's still a trade-off, even if you do nothing. If you plan it, you're normally trading a, um, a sandy or muddy bottom habitat for one that's um, going to have marsh on it. That's still a trade. Harden the shoreline, you're protecting the upland, but you're sacrificing whatever's seaward of it. Trap some sand, you're going to bury what's whatever is, is under it, and add some sand is the same way. You're going to bury whatever is underneath it with higher elevations of sand. So keep in mind that anything you do, including nothing, is going to be a trade-off. 
And that's been a contentious issue um, over time. Um, I've been involved over the last 37 years with the Division of Coastal Management in a, a large variety of estuarine erosion control solutions, and they've all been highly frustrated. The last version was uh, a committee that was assembled by DCM to look at uh, the options that could be applied. And overall, it was a very frustrating experience. There were lots of different specialists that came in to offer their advice. All was, was very um, well delivered and very well received. But the problem we faced was that my critter is best. So the end result of this study was that whatever you got, you keep. But I just said every management option is a trade-off. So you can't really just keep what you got. That anything you do is going to change what you have. So get over it. <laughs> it's going to happen. Now, one of the things I want to get off on the top is that if we're making rational trade-offs, what information do we have on how to choose what we want to move, which direction we want to move into? And one of the, the projects that we funded was a marsh acreage study behind Topsail Island. This is the south end of, uh, of Topsail Beach. Uh, Surf City Bridge is up at the top. The canal lots on uh, Topsail Beach are down at the south. Um, some of our UNCW colleagues measured the acreage in marsh over a series of aerial photography uh, going back, uh, it's on the next slide. What is that? Uh, well, it's a period of 49 years in, in the study, so almost 50 years. And they looked at two measurements. They looked at the marsh loss over that time period and some intermediate photography. And that shows up in red in, in this picture. So you can see there's a significant amount of erosion along the intracoastal waterway. There's uh, some erosion up at, near the inlet as it's migrating to the south. If you look at the area of marsh re recovery or accretion, that there are areas that recovered and accreted during that same time period. Um, but if we look at, at the bottom line is, is what's happening to open water and what's happening to our, our marsh acreage in this particular area, which is pretty representative of Cape Lookout South. Um, you'll notice that open water areas are increasing on the order of uh, six or seven percent, yet look at the change in marsh acreage. Over 49 years, we lost 18.7 percent in this particular study area. And if you go up into the, some bigger sounds up in the northeast, those losses are, are likely to be much higher than that. So we're losing a lot of marsh. So if we're looking at the environmental issues involved with this, if we're going to have to trade habitats, what habitat do we want to enhance and what habitat are we willing to sacrifice? And from studies like this, I would argue that the one that we ought to be trying to enhance, even if we're trading something else, is in favor of marshes and sacrificing some open water if we have to. So there is some environmental horse trading that makes sense to me, and I hope it makes sense to you as well. If we look in more detail at the land, uh, at the erosion management options, the first one was land management, and the first alternative is live with it. Now, if you're an estuarine property owner, is that gonna make a big difference? Are you gonna lose a lot of money? The answer to that is no that most waterfront property is not based by the square footage of the property, it's by the, the shoreline linear footage. So unless something is threatened or something is not threatened, the value of the property changes relatively little at, even though it, it's eroding. So if the property is big enough to avoid the threat, you can lose property and not lose value in the overall land value. So while that sounds kind of crazy, 
that it's actually a lot different than if your land is priced on a square footage basis. So sometimes you can avoid it with setbacks and buffers. Uh, that's simply building and staying out of the way, planning for erosion that you know is already occurring on the property. Uh, you have to do that up front. You can't do that at the end when the problem is a building is too close to the water. Um, there are cases where you can move what's threatened. That's been more commonly used on the beachfront, but is still an option and usually less expensive than, um, than one might think. Uh, the problem with those is that in the people I deal with as an extension specialist, about half of them can't tolerate it, maybe more. They're very uncomfortable with watching their shoreline wash away. They think they're losing value whether they are or not, and they want to do something about it. Um, the next option is, is to plant it, and you can do that either by flattening the upland slope and replanting with terrestrial grasses and vegetation, or you can do that with marsh grasses. Now, the nice thing about that option is if you've got a, a, a low bank and moderate erosion rates, uh, planting it with marsh grasses is probably the cheapest alternative that you can come with, up with. And as you heard from Carolyn, that um, the marshes are pretty good wave dissipators. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where this stuff is going to work. If you walk along most of our estuarine shorelines that are irregular with, with marshes or not, and you look at what's happening to the upland property, not the shoreline itself necessarily, but the upland property, that if you can keep 20 feet of marsh along most of our shorelines, there's usually not much upland erosion that the property owners are worried about. 20 feet or more is the target that I'm looking for. And you can do that, as Carolyn suggested, by looking at the sites around the places that you're working. It's convincing evidence to property owners if you can show them that, well, look, your neighbor's got 20 feet of marsh and their shoreline isn't eroding. You don't have a marsh and your beach is moving towards your house. Think about it. Now, some of the early, the, the way the marshes work um, is the surface roughness that's created by the stems of the plants. That dissipates the wave as it moves through the marsh grasses at, at lower water depths anyway. But the other method that it works uh, is by creating a tough root mat, and that's normally with smooth cord grass or with uh, black needle rush. They, they build these tough root mats on the surface that can take a tremendous amount of pounding from above. And that not only slows the wave by the stems, but it also forces the wave to break because of the shallow water. And when it does that, the breaking can take place on the surface of the root mat where it does little or no damage to the marsh. So it's this wave breaking effect and the toughness of the surface of the root mat, as well as the stem density and surface roughness that the marshes create that makes them effective at, at erosion control. Now, it would be nice if I could stand up here and tell you that you can go out and plant marsh grass anywhere you want and solve everybody's problem. But they've been looking at this for 60 years or more. And the, the general research indicates that if you've got more than four miles of fetch and, and boat wakes, that you're probably not going to successfully even get a marsh started on its own just by planting. Uh, the successful projects begin to start with a fetch of about a mile and no boat wakes. If you want to know a measure of the impact of the boat wakes, take a look at any of the man-made cuts on the intercoastal waterway that were constructed back in the 1930s that roughly uh, the open water channel from what was constructed has doubled. So the erosion of the adjacent shorelines is about a quarter of the width that you can see today. So those boat wakes are a significant factor in, in any of these erosion problems. So in those areas with, with more than a mile of fetch or significant boat wakes, the likelihood of just planting marshes is not impossible, but it's highly unlikely on any given site. And the problem with losing marshes and, and planting marshes 
is less at the original uh, development date, it gets worse as time goes on. If you're planning for erosion control, you know the shoreline is already eroding. So you've got to plan in the right water depths. It successfully builds a root mat that gives you the properties you want, both the stem densities and the, the tough surface layer. But the weakness of the marshes for erosion control is not at the high water conditions, it's at the low water conditions. Because of the limited thickness of the root mat, there are underlying soft sediments that at lower tides and at low tide boat wakes, they're much more susceptible to undermining and then the marsh falls off in, in clumps. So it breaks off a big chunk of the root mat and washes it down the shoreline somewhere and it's lost forever. And uh, where, where that occurs uh, and we look at, at the addition of structures, the general idea of what we're trying to do is come up with a minimum cost way to prevent that from happening. And it would be nice if you could go back out and just replant it. The problem is that because the, uh, the, the typical grasses that we're using uh, are growing between mid-tide and, and high tide for smooth cord grass and a little higher for black needle rush, that you can't go b back and plant the same area that just where it had a marsh wash out. It's often too deep. So you've got to back up and retreat. And in many cases, there isn't enough room to do that. Now, you can get aggressive with, with agricultural practices. I mean, uh, my folks at, at NC State can tell you how to grow just about anything. But uh, even if you get it started, you still got that root mat problem. And uh, while it, it grows for a time, it's susceptible to that undermining. And another problem that we face is, is marsh migration. And Carolyn talked a little bit about that. But uh, for you engineers out there, I've got an actual equation here. Um, if you look at the impacts of uh, a sea level rise, uh, assuming the root mat growth can keep up with it, that you're still faced with erosion of the, the seaward edge. And in order to keep the same marsh width, you have to have a landward migration of the back edge of the marsh that has to equal the erosion rate. And that's based on the slope of, of the back side of the marsh, not the front side, but the back side. So if we've got this erosion rate on the seaward side in here, and we, we want to keep up with that, to keep the same marsh width on the other side, uh, Phillips did some sea level rise work that looked at Uh, in this case, we used a foot and a half per century, which is kind of a mid-level accelerated um, uh, rise in sea level over the historical records. That what you need from that uh, is something on the order of a one degree slope. Now, for all we know, there's a one degree slope on the floor of this building, and you wouldn't notice it. So in order to keep up marsh migration with the erosion of of these rates, it's going to take an extremely flat slope on the backside of the marsh. Now, looking at shorelines, how many backsides of the marshes are you going to see with one degree slopes? Almost none. There's a, a low bank of some kind and there could be a 30 foot bank in some cases. So the marsh migration problem is really a, a problem less of sea level rise rates and more of the landward slope of whatever you're working with. So as sea level rises, the likelihood of higher erosion rates in the marshes are extremely likely, mainly because the landward side can't keep up. Not that the growth rate in elevation can't keep up. It's the landward side that really can't keep up with the seaward losses. And I've done something here. Anybody know why I've got that screen down there? I escaped and it didn't do anything. Okay, looks good. Thank you. Okay, we're on the shoreline hardening option three. That normally means vertical bulkheads or seawalls, sloping revetments, stone or concrete. Uh, 
you know, bulkheads are probably the most common solution, some kind of vertical wall. Um, there was a, um, could be a marsh in front of it, could be a beach. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a contrived debate on uh, whether seawalls cause erosion or not. And it was primarily centered on oceanfront issues. And there was a fairly violent disagreement between engineers and geologists. I'm actually both, so I got caught in the middle. Um, but it was really the wrong question that there are at least temporary erosion-induced problems on the oceanfront um, caused by vertical walls. What didn't get debated was how fast that recovers. And if you look at ocean surveys, beaches recover more days in front of vertical walls than they erode. They erode for a very few days during storm events, but they recover for many, many days after that, weeks or months. So that's not really the problem. You put in an erosion control structure because you've got an erosion problem. Erosion doesn't have to be caused by the structure. In most cases, it's already there. Who's going to spend money to control erosion if you don't have an erosion problem? Not many people. So the issue is not whether these structures cause erosion. It's what are the consequences of these structures if we have a, an existing erosion problem. And the, the consequences are not under debate. The geologists and engineers have always agreed. If you take an eroding shoreline and you harden the shoreline, you're going to lose whatever seaward of it. It's not a debate. I mean, it's a simple fact we all agree to. So the real issue is not whether these things are causing erosion. It's the consequences on an eroding shoreline, which is, includes most of our shorelines and the estuaries and the ocean front. And it doesn't really matter what type of structure it is. While the vertical structures get the big splashes and additional scour, that they're actually just as serious problems on revetments. Uh, and as an aside, this is actually Pete Peterson's backyard. If any of you know Pete, that's his revetment. Or it could be a, a sloping concrete revetment. Uh, these types of structures are highly unstable and not particularly good engineering choices. Even small amounts of undermining usually lead to collapse of the structures. So we don't see many of those, which is a good thing in North Carolina. And the other issue is that one thing that the, the, the Estuary and Erosion Control Committee did look at and put in the publication is, is one of the most significant differences in minimizing the impacts of any of these structures is the farther landward you move them, the less the impact, whatever the structure is. So it may not be good for erosion control, but it's going to have less impact. So if I go build a vertical wall in Raleigh, when's it going to be a problem on the coast? Not real soon, we hope. Uh, so the, the presumption is that uh, revetments or a common misconception is the revetments are always better than, than vertical walls. And under the, the findings of that committee, it's not the type of structure necessarily, it's the location of the structure. So this happens to be an oceanfront condition, but um, think of this as, as hardening any shoreline, estuarine or ocean. You've got an erosion rate that's already in place. It's not caused by the wall, but it pre-existed. So what are the consequences of losing that over time? Now, if you've got a beach with no structure, that beach is going to be there. It just going to, it will be farther landward. But if we compare the case of hardening a particular point to protect that, that point right there, and we look at the differences between a vertical wall and a revetment, the differences will be something like that. So what happens is the farther we put the structure to the point of protection, farther seaward we put the, the structure relative to the point of protection, the sooner we lose whatever is seaward of it. So in many of our estuarine cases, while a revetment may be a, a, a better way to break the waves, it's not an issue of the reflection that determines when it's nothing left in front of it. It's an issue of the location.
So it's a mistake to think that revetments are inherently better than vertical walls. You have to put that in context with where the structure sits. And most of the revetments for any given property are going to be farther seaward. The state gives revetments an extra 10 feet seaward of a bulkhead location. So you're going to lose the, the shoreline features seaward of it 10 feet sooner when you use rock rather than, than vertical walls. And fourth is trap some sand. That's usually with groins, which could be segmented above water or submerged, and breakwaters. Um, I'm sure most of you know what groins are. They simply trap sand that's moving in a longshore transport. They trap sand on one side, and the trade-off is that they prevent sand from getting to the other side. So somebody's got to have some additional erosion. And what do you do if you're causing erosion on your neighbor? You put in another groin. And in the middle of the island, in the middle of the shoreline, there's an obvious problem with that. Uh, somebody's got to be at the end of the system somewhere, and that can be a significant problem because of all the sand you've trapped in the central part of, uh, of the shoreline. Now, the best of the sand traps are offshore breakwaters. Um, they trap sand moving in both directions, not, not one direction. So it doesn't matter if any sand's moving in either direction, it's going to get trapped behind the breakwater. They tend to be much more difficult to design. They really re require a professional designer trained in breakwater design. Um, but they can trap a lot of sand. And you're going to see this described in more detail um, in some of the case studies, but this is Carteret Community College. And the, the picture is, is, is used because the breakwaters um, are sometimes considered living shorelines by some definitions, but that's really on the borderline of building beaches versus living shorelines. Certainly there's some vegetation involved on, on building these beaches, but most of the offshore breakwater structures are, are used for building beaches rather than marsh areas. And the reason for that, you can see a boat wake in, in this picture. And the function of the breakwater is to refract and diffract waves as it comes around it. And it does that, that redirecting the wave and spreading out the energy over a longer stretch of beach. And it also reflects waves into the, the very backside of, of the breakwater. So it tends to be more active wave conditions behind these breakwaters than marshes like to survive. So they tend to be beach builders rather than marsh builders in most cases. We can add sand to the system as number five. That's beach fill or beach nourishment. We use that on uh, a number of beach areas in North Carolina. They've been successful for over 50 years in some areas. Now, on estuarine areas, it's a simple issue. It's against state rules. You can't use beach fill or beach nourishment for estuarine erosion control. So it, it isn't really an option in the state. Okay, we go back to, to our erosion management options. We've got plant it and harden the shoreline. And the reason we're here today is that somewhere in the middle of those two, more or less, sometimes creeping over the, the fringes, is our living shoreline issues. So if you want a definition of living shorelines, it's something that is in that kind of range. And there are lots of ways to skin a cat. You're going to hear a number of them today. When I got interested in, in, in uh, marsh sills and living shorelines, planting marshes where they wouldn't otherwise grow, um, we looked around at what was out there in, in use for one reason or another. We found that there were many sill type structures that were already in use, but had no intention of being built for that purpose. Uh, this was one of the more extreme examples. It's from Ocracoke Island near the uh, ferry terminal. Uh, in the Ash Wednesday storm in 1962, the backside of the island got severely eroded. It has a 40-mile fetch, and they built a sackcrete wall with some emergency management money. And the plan was to build the wall and then backfill it with, with soil later. Well, they ran out of money, and they ran out of soil, and they never backfilled it. And there were some damage to sections of the Sackcrete wall, some holes developed, 
but in the end, it's functioned since for over 50 years as an effective sill and marsh project. So there are lots of cases where these accidental structures are in place. This is another section of the Ocracoke Wall. Again, it's been in place for over 50 years with a 40 mile fetch. And I, I, I make the statement with only a few fine print reservations that if you want to build a marsh sill in anywhere in North Carolina, you can do it with the right construction and design techniques. Almost anywhere in the state, in the estuaries, it'll work if you've got enough money and if you've got the right design. Now, when we started building marsh sills, um, North Carolina had a particular problem that still hasn't gone away, that anything you put on public bottom is like selling your sister. You don't do that. So we couldn't get rock structures that would take up 10 or 15 feet of public bottom land. We had to come up with a way that would be a very small footprint that would allow us to get permits. Otherwise, it was out of the question. And fill was not an option that it had to be sloped at naturally occurring uh, slopes that we could plant effectively. So we ended up with, with wooden sills in our early tests. And w we tried to look at what was in effect already and how that was, was being successfully applied. Uh, we knew that the, the marsh uh, smooth cordgrass was going to grow between mid-tide and, and high water, so that was the target areas that we looked at. Uh, they gave us permission to go our 20 feet offshore, but no more than that with the early permits. And the other thing we learned from looking at existing structures, and Tracy's going to talk more about this one later, but uh, the, the point I need to make is that uh, that we, we were required to put openings in the wall one way or another, and that's a good engineering solution because if you have a solid structure along the shoreline, whether it's rock or wood or, or any material like that, and, and make it watertight, breaking waves are going to come over, uh, over the top of it at the, the low elevations, and it's going to raise the water level behind the structure. And that water is going to want to get back to the water body through the easiest pathway it can find. And in this case, the easiest pathway was the, these baffled areas that had been intentionally installed to add to circulation. So the net result was a number of these baffles scoured uh, to six feet of water depth in what was originally three feet or two feet. So in order to effectively build these structures, you need circulation throughout the structure or, uh, or around it. Uh, you don't want water ponding behind it or you're going to have scour problems one place or another. Another lesson we learned was that some permit agency that I won't name uh, required that every third board in a wooden breakwater be, uh, be left open. So the structure was two-thirds solid and one-third open. And what became obvious very quickly after this area was planted is that the wave transmission for even two-thirds solid is close to 100 well, percent, certainly more than 90 percent and probably around 95 percent of the waves are going to go right on through those, th those holes. You're not going to stop two-thirds of the wave activity even though you're making two-thirds solid. So that too much porosity is going to allow too much wave transmission and not an effective pr area protected enough to, to plant marshes. Now at this same site, uh, in the distance, looking the other way, um, this is one of the, the better marsh sill structures in Currituck Sound, uh, just north of the, uh, the Corps of Engineers Research Facility, and they're doing a nice job with black needle rush in this area. So this is a, a more solid uh, wood sill and a very effective right beside one that just had too much opening. And the other thing that, that Carolyn touched on, but here's an example of, is you know, the only way these things work in low cost structures uh, is in combination with planted marshes. So if you can't grow a marsh, you're probably not going to solve the problem of the upland erosion. 
And in, in this case, uh, a number of storms hit this area. While it was originally open water, the small sill, wooden sill, was enough to trap sand behind it. And that meant that we couldn't grow mar enough marsh grass to protect the upland property behind it. So these small sill structures are not intended to trap sand like the bigger breakwaters. They're intended to do nothing more and should be designed for nothing more than to create an area where you can successfully plant a marsh where it would not otherwise exist. And I, I guess um, one of the other things that we learned from working with the, the wooden sills is that uh, unlike stone, we could carefully control the elevation of the top of the structure relative to the normal high water level. And we determined pretty quickly that an optimum elevation relative to the root mat at mean high water was about six inches higher. So that we've consistently targeted six inches above normal high water as an effective elevation if you can exactly control the, the crest elevation of the structure. Now, one of the problems we faced is that every contractor we dealt with thought bigger and taller was better. So if you raise the elevation of the structure, you get no more protection to the marsh, but you get a lot more wave force on the structure itself. So lower is actually better. One of the goals of designing for any given site is to figure out how low you can go, which means how cheap you can do the job. So lower is not necessarily uh, worse, and in often many cases, it's, I'll show you, it, it can be better. Now, one of the problems um, designers face, and I, I sympathize with the engineers in the room that may have to sign and seal something, is that if you look at design guidance that's out there originally targeting and mostly ocean beaches and in many cases very big wave ocean beaches, you know, you're looking at design guides that were uh, looking at, at jetties and oceanfront breakwaters and in using those materials uh, to be safe under those design parameters, it looks like it needs to be a very big stone. You gotta have a big piece of rock to keep it from moving around and to break the waves before it gets to whatever you want to protect it behind you. Now the problem with that is that um, we've seen many examples of professionally designed structures that were grossly over-designed for the conditions that they needed. And that's understandable because it's the safety factors that engineers normally put in and they wanna give a product to the upland owner that isn't gonna fail. And these things won't fail but they'll be real expensive and they'll be way over what you really need. And one of the best examples or worst examples, depending on your perspective, uh, is this structure on Ocracoke. Uh, it's within stone's throw distance of the, uh, the Sack Creek structure I showed you before that's a lot smaller, but it's got massive stone, massive width, and it's sure gonna create a, a, a wetland behind it, but in terms of what you're marketing for property owners, that if this wasn't a public project, it never would have gotten built. No private owner would have built anything this scale. So in order to work on these marsh seal structures, you're looking at the smallest structure you can get away with rather than something massive that's guaranteed to be fail safe for the next couple centuries. Uh, as an example of that, um, this is on the Cape Fear River uh, in Southport, and it's, uh, this is about a, uh, a year after original construction. And the, uh, the adjacent property owners weren't happy. It was built by the town and protecting some property owners as well as a public park. And if we look at this three years later, you know, this, this elevation sill is, is about at mean high water on the Cape Fear River. And that's my target elevation for stone sills. Accounting for settlement in the future is, is about a foot with an irregular surface. So this is much lower than I would anticipate being good design. We look at the other direction. There was actually a bulkhead in place. Small sill was constructed to protect the remnant of the marsh it was eroding away. Again, mean high water elevation. And a couple years later, it's got a good growth of marsh. The problems have gone away. 
And this area is, is particularly uh, treacherous because it's subject to not barge wakes, but ship wakes. And those are coming in at probably twice the height of even the barge wakes and, and other boat wakes. So um, it's a pretty brutal shoreline, yet this little structure is, is doing an excellent job at a low cost to the community. And in, um, as Carolyn said earlier, one of the most important things you can do for property owners is to look around that existing shoreline. Look at what's working, look at the widths of marsh that are effective, and what you can do to, to mimic that that's already in place. Now, one of the things that the American Society of Civil Engineers and the uh, Coast Ocean Ports and Rivers Institute within them is doing is trying to uh, set up a system on a web page that will document projects, their success or their failures. And that that's a work in progress we're just starting on. We don't think that we can stand in front of you today and tell you how big your rock needs to be and what other parameters you might want to use on most of these projects without seat of the pants experience. But the goal of this is, is to document what's working out there and to make it available to you to see what's working in the area and, and how you may make it useful. And uh, you, you'll be able to enter your own sites, include pictures. The, uh, the dots in here are sites that have already been added. If you, you happen to use it, the website is posted on that previous slide. Um, keep in mind that it's still a work in progress. There's some dummy pictures in there that obviously don't fit with the sites you're looking at, and it's going to be uh, adding a lot more projects and correcting the errors that are in it now over the next year. So with that, I'll, I'll close and open up to any questions if there's any time remaining. you you got to use the mic. Was the Carteret Community College track uh, an experiment? Was it moderately successful? Was it a disaster? Looked like to me it saved part of the shoreline. What, what's your take on that a little bit more in depth? All of the above. <laughs> um, it, it was professionally in part professionally designed and in part was purely experimental. I think the, uh, the oyster bags and the, the reef balls were uh, clearly experimental and not not engineered. Um, one of the the stone sills, the thing closest to a stone sill, is probably way over designed by intention or accident. I'm not sure which. And the breakwaters are doing exactly what they were supposed to do. So the the twin breakwaters behind the CMAS building, uh, I think, are right on the target for performance that we expected. Spencer, I'm sure Alexio will talk about this more later, but on, on the Southport site, did you do any marsh planting? Yes, it was planted. It took uh, a couple growing seasons to get established, but the, the most important thing I, I've seen on getting the marsh established is if you don't get it a foothold, there's a pretty good chance the entire project will fail. And some of the permits require it to grow, not you gotta remove the structure if it doesn't grow that has never been enforced yet, but probably should be. But uh, the real important thing is getting a foothold to get it starting to spread. So you don't have to plant the entire structure successfully on the first go round, but it's really important to get it going. Because we've seen a number of properties like Southport where uh, the adjacent owners were really ticked off when a storm came through and they got about three feet of erosion that washed out their irrigation system. And they, they perceive that as a failure, but the marsh hadn't gotten a foothold yet. Um, three years later, nobody's complaining. Thank you. Any other questions for Spencer? You ain't got to yet. I talked about it. They need it for the recording. So the Southport site, you, if I heard you correctly, that sill was right at mean high tide elevation. And when we have a high energy wave 
uh, you know, from shipping or uh, ferry, or whatever it may be, are you recommending six inches above? For, for stone structures, my, my recommendation on place elevation to start is a foot above mean high water. A foot, okay. But that, that's presumed that there will be some settlement over time. That you, It's next right. impossible to build a stone structure without some settlement. In contrast, the, the wooden and vertical structures, if you build it at six inches above mean high water, it's going to be there in however long it lasts. Okay. Thank you. Any last questions? I'll be around. Catch me later. Awesome. Thank you, Spencer.